This is my week eight video log for my independent study. This week was my last week working on uh, optimization work, and I think I finally have the collision detection system at a running at a level that I'm happy with. Um, these are the results of my most recent test run with uh, 10,000 collidable objects. That's 5,000 um, oriented boxes and 5,000 spheres. Um, you can see that the total collision detection time takes only five milliseconds, and grid and of that, the actual grid collision time is only 1.6 milliseconds. Um, I'm, I'm now at the point where um, the pre-processing step, this is this BVH update, is the pre-processing step where I take the updated uh, transform information and I convert it into like the OBB or I apply and I apply like scale to the sphere and that sort of thing. Um, so that that step as well as the uh, the collision processing step is taking more time than the actual collision detection step. So that tells me that I need to start optimizing other parts of the collision system or, and other parts of the engine as well. Um, is, is I found that in higher t uh, higher load tests, like if I push it to 20,000 collidable objects or 50,000 collidable objects, um, even this even this transform update pass, which is where I take the the derived transform values, or I take the um, uh, like I, t I take its its local coordinates and I convert it to world coordinates. Even that will even that pass will take four or five milliseconds, which is far too much time when I'm trying to run at 60 frames per second. So at this point, it's safe to say that the grid collision system is the most is the most heavily optimized and most production ready part of my um, my engine. And even then, it still has. I'm sure there's still uh, a great deal of room available for uh, improvements. Like I haven't done anything with sim uh, simmed instructions or um, there's no use of the GPU in the collision pass which could do um, could immensely help in, in improving collision times um, so the biggest optimizations that I the biggest optimizations that I made this week was first I implemented um, automatically resizing the grid cells previously the grid cells were hard-coded to be one unit in length. Excuse me. Um, and as a result, objects could potentially overlap multiple grid cells, and they could have 10 or they could, they could require like 10 or 20 grid lookups to, uh, to fully perform their, their uh, broad phase collision resolution. And reducing the number of grid lookups vastly improves the, um, the broad phase collision pass because uh, doing those grid those hash grid lookups are the most expensive part of the uh, the broad phase pass so part of what I did is here in a grid collision system in update I've added a I think it's right here I added a pre-pass so what I do is I iterate over all of my uh, bounding volumes and I check which of the which axis is the longest, and then I use that to, if we look over here, we can see that I, I changed the cell size to be that longest value. Um, and this, this has actually a little bit of overhead. Um, if you, you can see right here, that's maybe a tenth of a millisecond, but as I start to push the numbers, if I go up to like 20,000 or 50,000, that, that starts to become more than, a, more than one or two milliseconds. Um, which is too expensive. However, this is this work that I'm performing is actually redundant. Um, it could be rolled more efficiently into the uh, BVH update, which already iterates all of over all of the volumes. So if I had the BVH manager just track that data anyway, um, this that could be optimized. But even in its current state, it's still it would still wound up being a big improvement because now the most cell lookups that could be required for um, a volume to perform its broad phase pass is eight, which is a big optimization and it wound up shaving a, a big chunk of time off the top of my, um, my grid lookup. Um, the other optimization uh, also improved grid lookup times. Um, and it does so by 
assuring that there are as few elements in the hash grid as possible, which means that the hash grid requires less memory, um, which improves cache locality, and it reduces the amount of uh, chaining needed to keep all the elements in, so it reduces the amount of the reduces the lookup time further. Um, to, the way that I was previously doing this is the uh, well, actually the hash grid itself. Let's see, it's not in worker. It's in work unit. Um, the hash grid itself didn't change. Um, the hash grid is still just a hash map that maps from a uh, an integer grid coordinate to this list of volumes. What changed was now the worker actually caches off those lists of volumes. And this, this vec of pointers to bound volumes, this is effectively uh, the cell that these are, this is what, this is how I represent each of the cells within the hash grid. Um, and what we'll see here is at the end of the grid collision pass, the worker actually goes over each of those cells and it, it empties out the hash grid. Um, this drain construction is something that's specific to Rust. It actually allows me to remove all of the elements from a data structure without clearing the, um, the backing store. Um, and it does so in a very efficient way. It allows me to iterate over all of the elements and then empty out the, 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 um, the uh, container in a single pass, and it does so in an optimized way. Um, so I iterate over all of those cells, and then I, I empty out the cell, and then I store it in a cache. And then at the, when I'm going through each, so that means at the beginning of each frame, um, at the beginning of each collision pass, it, that hash grid starts out completely empty. And then what I do is each time I have, I want to perform a collision test, um, I go to the grid and I look up the entry represented by that grid cell. And this entry API is something that's also specific to the Rust standard library. And what this is doing is it's, it's not lo looking up an element within the grid, it's looking up a bucket that could either have an element or could be empty. And then on that, I'm calling this or insert with method and I pass it in a closure. Um, and th what this will do is if that bucket that I've looked up already has an element in it, it'll just return that element without ever calling the closure. Um, if that bucket is empty, it calls this closure and it inserts the result of that closure into the into that bucket without doing an extra, without doing another uh, hash lookup and then it returns that result. And what this little closure that I'm passing in is doing is it just goes to the cell cache, it pops off the last element, and if there's no last element, that's what this unwrap or is checking for, it just returns an empty vector. Um, the end result is that on any given frame, there's only ever an element in the hash grid if there is actually a, vol a collision volume in that space. Previously, what would happen is if a say I've got a, a collision volume just moving horizontally through space, and it moves into uh, into the space covered by a grid cell, and then it moves out of that space. However, even though it's no longer in that that space in that grid cell, that grid cell was still present in the hash in the hash map, and that would over time there'd be a bunch of these unused grid cells in the hash map. And that would slow down lookup times. And it would also mean that there was a bunch of unused vectors that had to have just small allocations of maybe like one or two, a capacity of just like one or two elements. And that would lead to higher memory fragmentation. It would slow down lookup times. So doing this uh, optimized that situation and in combination with decreasing the number of grid lookups, that's where I get to this number of um, just shy of two milliseconds to perform, or actually not even, 1.6 milliseconds to perform the, the grid lookup time. Um, and like I said, I think I'm happy at that, that performance level. Ideally, in the future, I'd like to push that even further. I'd like to be able to go on to 100,000 collidable volumes and being able to run that at 60 frames per second. But I think that's going to require even more sophisticated broad phase passes. It's going to require um, more intelligent parallel parallelization. Um, I've had a lot of luck with my parallelism. Like I, l last week I mentioned that I was having this weird issue of um, 
multiple threads running in parallel slows things down. And I wanted to investigate that, but ultimately I've now have my worker threads just running so fast that I don't even notice that problem anymore. Um, but I think, but I think there's still probably ways that I could make my multi-threading more intelligent and work more efficiently. Um, I currently am not doing anything with SIMD. I'm not doing anything with the GPU. So there's still a lot of room for me to push this, but for the scope of this class and this independent study, um, I think I'm happy for now, and I can certainly start using this collision system in a game, and anything, any of the basic games that I would be trying to make, this would be more than enough to work for it. Um, I think from here on out, it's just going to be robustness work. I need to finish up putting together some unit tests because I don't really have any concrete verification that my collision tests are all running correctly in all cases. So I need to make sure that I'm testing for edge cases and corner cases and making sure that um, I know exactly to the specification to which my uh, collision system is performing. Um, I'd like to shoot for um, one more feature, which would be um, uh, collision groups. That was something that I had implemented last quarter in my very rudimentary collision system where you could sort your collidable objects and collision groups and then say which groups collide with each other or if elements within the same group should collide with them collide with each other um, and that system would be more difficult to implement with the grid collision system because it would require a kind of a, a, a more intelligent insertion order I'd have to be able to say, insert the elements from group A into the grid, and then insert the elements from group B into the grid, and then maybe insert the elements from group C, but don't t actually test any collisions, just insert them. And then insert the elements from group D, but don't test them against the elements from group A. And I, I really like that system, because that's a way for um, developers to reduce the number of coll um, collision tests that need to be done, and it allows the developer to have some hand in optimizing the collision system in a way that's specific to their game. However, it's not necessary for the time being, and I don't know how difficult it's going to be, be to implement, so I'm going to look into that. I'm going to see if I can figure out um, kind of a quick and w dirty way of doing it, and if not, then I'm just going to be focusing on uh, robustness for the rest of the quarter. Um, that's it for this week. I will see you next week.